And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer into the temple, creator of the upcoming RPG Morticians. And and um, and a man who know, who's going to know his horrors in and in and out coming to us from Cox and Media, the one and only Stephen J. Cochran. I hope I got pr the pronunciation right. How you doing today, man? I'm doing great. Thank you. Co-creator, co-creator. Actually, have a partner that I that I work. Uh, my wife actually works on the uh, morticians with me. Uh, and yeah, no, the pronunciations are correct. Most people actually really screw up Cochrane, believe it or not. And uh, you nailed it, brother. Thank you. Let me guess. They usually say Cochrane or something like that? Uh, Cochran. Cochran. And it, it doesn't help that I am in a predominantly Hispanic uh, uh, neighborhood, so I get a lot of Hispanic calls where um, the person on the other end is using... Um, uh, the, la the Latin base uh, root for how to pronounce things, um, and so the Irish really throws them off. Yeah, I could, I could, I could certainly see that. Um, then again, <laughs> i've I've had to I've had to have a crash course on the vast difference between um, between say Brazilian Portuguese and Portugal Portuguese. <laughs> yeah. And same thing with um Mexico Spanish or Latin American Spanish and Spain Spanish and hell even just the different um areas in Latin America you have certain quirks with how they with how Spanish is used. You know, honestly at this point um yeah, I I I don't even think what we speak in the United States is English. I think we should keep that to the English and we should call it something else. I've got uh, uh, Mexican friends who don't understand uh, Guadalajara, mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's it's like you know at this point it's gone for so long. Maybe we just start calling our uh, uh, our local coequals uh, 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 from uh, <laughs> what area they're actually from. Uh, temp tempting as that would tempting as that would be, the amount of legwork to to do that kind of thing. Especially since the U.S. doesn't have a official language that they adopt that's adopted. Right, 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 right. Yeah, that would uh, uh, that would be a, a big lift. Because the idea of adopting English as the official language of the United States has been considered over the decades, but every time it gets brought up, it gets shot down. Yeah, that's true. Well, I, I think uh, the United States should be the the exception to the rule, I guess, because. Um, we are just a mixed bag of everybody, aren't we? Mm -hmm. um, anyway, happy to be here. Thank you for inviting me on. Um, did you get a chance to read through the material or, or play the uh, demo? I got I got a chance to do do a little bit of experimenting. Um, oh, cool. I do I do appreciate that e even with the even with the small size of the demo, there are still proper bookmarks. Yeah, um, it's it's kind of um, well. We did the we did the play testing event, and then immediately we got tapped. Well, we want uh, we want to play it uh, digitally, and it was uh, it became a quick big question right off the gate. How do we uh, execute things without giving away the store? Um, and and uh, digital stuff, it's so easy to pass it in between people and. Um, we're not going to encrypt anything. Let's be honest. Uh, so it was. Uh, it's reduced the the play testing material um, was an extended version of that. But uh, we feel that um, not being able to give some kind of demo to uh, you know uh, creatives and uh, influencers like yourself uh, <laughs> would uh, defeat the purpose of what a, a, a you know play testing demo is all about. So we. We cut it down, and uh, and uh, I'm 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 glad you liked it. Mm -hmm. So, let me start with the humble traditions, in a sense. 
Walk me through your first introduction to role-playing games and what made it stick. Oh, wow. Okay, go going way back. Um, so I was I was raised in a very conservative uh, uh, Mormon household, so I didn't get the traditional D&D uh, uh, introduction like most people. My first introduction was um, a Vampire the Masquerade. And it was post high school. During high school, I did improv, uh, comedy, and two guys that I work I played with, both named Sam, um, introduced me to Vampire the Masquerade, and uh, one of them even invited me to um, the local college for a LARP event. And the the role playing was really fun, and that's what kind of got me into it in the beginning. Um, and I, I've played video games my entire life since the original Nintendo came out. I've I've played video games, so I'm not. I wasn't completely naive to uh, RPG mechanics, um, and so after the initial thrill of uh, you know role playing, the the game mechanics themselves started interesting me. The shortly thereafter, I was introduced to. Uh, Fallout PNP, which was the uh, original Black Isle game, but on a pen and paper form, uh, created by a guy by the name of Jason Micah, I think is his last name. Yeah. And what was that? No, I was just, I was just agreeing. And um, I'm. Oh. <laughs> yeah, that is Fallout's relationship with table with tabletop gaming is interesting. <laughs> yeah, to say the least to say the least um but after uh after fallout um i started uh looking for groups that played other stuff i actually didn't play any uh D, D until i think it was four years ago and i wanted to it's always been an interest of mine i finally got around to the opportunity to play it i bought a bunch of 4e stuff and a month after I got all my 4E stuff, they jumped to 5E. So maybe it was a little longer than, than four or five years ago. Um, I found a local game shop that was doing Introductory Adventure League uh, in 5E because I really wanted to learn uh, Dungeons & Dragons. And uh, I've been hooked ever since. Mm -hmm. So, with given that you mentioned Fallout, did... I apologize, you cut out there. What was that? All right, there you are. Okay, yeah. I, you cut out there for a second. Uh, yeah, what was Discord, the question? Discord decided to mess with my mic. What I was saying was, um, since you mentioned Fallout, I, sh I should ask if the... if um. Your experiences with Fallout, whether it be the video game or the PNP, did that play a factor into the creation of Morticians? Or was oh, there a yeah. point of uh, inspiration? 100%. I actually created Morticians using the PNP, and it, it started out as a homebrew. Um, I wanted to introduce my uh, nephews who were at the time uh, ranged in age from 11 to 13. Um, I was looking for people to play with, right? <laughs> it's like, I want to play role-playing games. They are the ideal age to play role-playing games. Um, so I introduced them to role-playing games through Fallout PNP, but I didn't. I knew that the, the crunchiness of it is uh, is a big lift for introductory. So I made I, I created a homebrew that was zombie-based, um, at this point, that was, I want to say that was 2012. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, we're, we're coming up on, uh, I think, 14 years now uh, working on it. And it started out with, as a homebrew. Um, it's incredibly crunchy because the original PNP is based for a computer to do all the calculations. So since 2012, I took those original concepts and ideas that I created for that game, and I've been t I've been tweaking with them ever since. I stopped working on it for about eight years, um, but that influence is not has never left the game. Um, 
a lot of the spirit of PNP is still uh, very much ingrained in morticians. Mm -hmm. And since you mentioned 2011-ish, um, I, ca I kind of have to ask because it's one of those elephant in the room situations, but did The Walking Dead serve as an influence? No, actually. I didn't start watching watching The Walking Dead until season four. But 2011 was a big year for zombies. Um, I've always been a zombie fan. Um, I owned a, a, a red box DVD of the remastered Night of the Living Dead and um, huge fan of the genre, hence why the game's about zombies. Um, yeah, Walking Dead for me came later, interesting enough. And, um, I'm a, I'm a huge fan of the series. I think it's, it, it, it has its peaks and its valleys. They sometimes hit some amazing stuff. And sometimes it's like, what are you guys doing here? Someone should fire the writer. Um, but it did not have as much of an influence as, as one would expect. Actually, the, the show that had the most influence um, on the game isn't a zombie show at all. It's called uh, um, After People, and it was on the History Channel. And um, post 9-11, uh, after all the footage of the towers coming down, uh, the History Channel took uh, 3D modeling and kind of showed how buildings would collapse, and they kind of showed the world after people. And it's, you know, books are rotting and the cockroach population takes off and, and uh, you know, the animals go wild and feral and everything. And watching that show uh, raised a lot of questions because during the show they talk about all this stuff happening, but they don't actually talk about what happens to the people. Mm -hmm. And um, the thing about people are, is, is that, you know, we don't just disappear uh we if we if there was a math, mass extinction um there would be environmental consequences that would happen almost overnight and a lot of what morticians is about is what happens to the environment from a mass extinction event um in morticians the the wa the water's polluted we have uh, necrotic rain which is infected with back C, which is uh, um, uh, the, the zombie spreading bacteria. Um, you know, the world, uh, nature's a powerful thing and it starts tearing the world apart, but our uh, rotting bodies and, and the ruins we leave behind would have an integral effect on the environment. And the morticians is kind of a way to address some of those issues. And when, it's not a complete extinction event. I said mass extinction, but in morticians, humans survive, uh, even if it's a, it's only about 10% of the population. Um, how do those survivors regroup and, and, and recoup? And, and, you know, you mentioned The Walking Dead. Uh, one of my pet peeves about shows like The Walking Dead is how they portray humanity after a cataclysm. The whole and everybody gets selfish kind of thing. Exactly, exactly. Because we we have historic events, current and in the past, where shit happens. Uh, uh, tornadoes, hurricanes, floods, tsunami, um, earthquakes, fires. And what we do as a species is we do band together. Now, there's always going to be jerks. There's always going to be dickheads, right? There's always going to be people who are going to take the opportunity for a power grab to exert their authority and, and to be bullies. But for the most part, when tragedy hits to that scale, we as people tend to pull together. And part of morticians is that that human trait of we're going to try to figure this out and we're going to and survive. Mm-hmm. And, and we joke and, um, you know, we, we, we say things like uh, adventuring through the zombie apocalypse or don't just be a survivor, be a mortician, join today, right? Or be a hero, join today. Mm -hmm. 
and that sentiment and those catchphrases uh, we feel play into to human nature. It's also one of the, the, the driving forces of what makes D&D fun. Um, Faron is a world post-cataclysm. Um, and that, that's the reason why you have dungeons and runes to investigate to look for magic. There was a civilization before it that um, had technological and magical uh, 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 advancements ho- higher than the current state. And communities, and reason why adventurers go out and do stuff is they're trying to survive in this very hostile world. And um, we try to lean into that with morticians of that, yes, shit happens, this happened, but we're going to adore and we're going to create mechanics for you to go out and explore and succeed. And um, is, uh, is it going to be easy? No, but it's going to be a hell of a ride. And when you mentioned the whole join the morticians thing, the first thing that came to my head was service guarantees citizenship. (laughs) And I'm not saying we're going that far, but some. Right, right, right. I do find it interesting that you have the morticians as this organization that you're going through the ranks of, which I'm guessing for you was a good way to integrate more more gamist mechanics when it comes to advancement. Yeah, um, so um, we wanted to, always, there was always the ability, um, like I said earlier, you know, there was a major influence with Fallout, and they have a perk system as you level up. Uh, uh, D&D has a feat system that um, uh, as you level up, you get to pick a feat and stuff like that, and so that mechanic of as you get better, you get uh perks uh really um really is a is is a fun way to play um so we we created the the ranking system specifically to add that mechanic so characters feel like they're actually growing um but in a way that didn't feel uh cheap Mm -hmm. now since you mentioned a background with the fallout pnp is that the main reason why um, Morticians is a role under D100 system? Yes. Yeah, actually. Um, that's exactly why it's a role under D100 system. Uh, that That's how it started. Um, the skills have been... Uh, there's different skills and there's reduced, so you don't have a, a, as much of a variety. The, the main thing that we went through with the skill system and when looking at uh, the, the PMP with its influence was the crunchiness. So it was, how do we simplify the math? Um, what we're finding with playtesting is that players understand percentage better than plus one D20. And it, it, it's kind of an interesting phenomenon because D&D is king. Um, but D&D is a, per- a percentage system that works on intervals of five, if you look at the D20 as 100%, hmm. the plus one is just plus five and, and whatnot. So um, transitioning it from to a, hundred, to a percentile system, people pick up on that quickly. And uh, so it was one of those things where like, well, we could, we could shift it and change it because the math's all there to do a, a, another mechanic. But people grasp percentage really really well so let's not mess with that Mm -hmm. so with within that what i also find interesting is the uh, is the fact is the archetype setup that you have since a lot of a lot of games that do a um a post-apocalypse approach Tend to go tend to go semi classless, tend to go a bit free form, right. and you went you went with an archetype approach, which I'd say is a I'd say is more of a pack more of unless I'm misreading it, archetypes are more of a starting package than what some people would consider a class. That's correct. It is it is a starting package. In fact, in um, the the core rulebook will have outlines in how to create your own archetypes. One of the things about the zombie apocalypse 
is that there it, it's it's loaded with cliches. I mean, we have a plethora of movies to pull from, books, literature, and comics, and and, and people really relate to the uh, the cliches. So, with the archetype system, it is it is a package, and every archetype starts with two merits and two flaws, and um, people grab onto oh, an athlete, okay, but athletes are varied, and uh, we we uh, run a live stream called Ladies of the Horde that airs every other Sunday and um, we have an athlete who happens to be a pothead um, there's another archetype called the fanatic in which the fanatic originally was um, you know the survivalist fanatic someone in the in the backwoods but when we changed the language from survivalist to fanatic uh, people started interpreting it as, oh, well, I'm a collector, I'm a fanatic, and I'm a collector of this type. And so, even though it's a, it's a it's a package deal with your with the merits and flaws, people really still have the room to give it the flavor they want. Um, I find a lot of times in, in in the class system, it's like, well, this is what a this is what a fighter is going to do, or this is what a warlock is going to do, and they don't really expand farther on on what that class really means but with archetypes people are like oh well i'm this type um it allows for sub genres to really kind of seep into the character development it's funny you mentioned fighters as an example because in the past one thing i had criticized is how fighter as a archetype or a class or what have you is way too broad because it begins and ends with good with weapons well right right <laughs> let's let's look at the Somebody who so let's look at the myriad weapons that are going to be used in in say a um say an SCA event. Whether you've got sword and board, whether you've got great swords, whether you've got people with with flails, and whether you've got people with pull, with pole arms, with halberds, and all of them are going to be demanding diff um different approaches and different um different tor types of mo different types of motions, different muscles. And so and so on. And if I have to use a video game example, consider how. Let's let's look at say, um, Tekken, because I grew up more with Tekken than I did with Street Fighter. <laughs> <laughs> every every, al almost every character in that could be viewed as a unarmed fighter. But if you were to, if you were to do that within games that have a class system. You'd have way too many people end up playing the same playing the same way because the fighting styles that they have aren't able to be expressed. Right, right. It's it's it. You know, my issue with fighter is that uh, isn't technically everyone fighting. So this this idea that the fighter covers this broad stretch it's like but but everyone's fighting i i, I always felt like they, they could have come up with a better name than fighter originally it was fighting man oh, really interesting so that just invokes images of, of a bar brawler oh uh, one of my one of my favorite hacks of D D third edition is fantasy craft and instead of fighter they went with soldier So I know nothing of third edition. I played a little bit of two E, but I've never even touched three or three point five. The the point is, is that sol I'd say soldier has a more has a more defined net that it's casting as opposed to fighter or fighting man. Okay. Especially since the way it was set up was you're was you you're not only good with weapons you're able to get weapons at a discount and repair them a lot more easily than everybody else right 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 but cuz the and the even though I the reason why I said the starting package is because of the um the way you have merits um further further into the material and how the the only th the main thing that's a limiting factor when not sorry not merit some abilities and the main which are right. 
they're, assen they're essentially not far removed from perks, if I'm reading this right. But the main thing, the main defining th thing when it comes to what sort of what sort of ones you could get is just your level. Aside fr aside from a few that have prerequisites in certain th in certain things, but the the main one is just level. Right, and you know that's kind of the beautiful thing about going the archetype route is it doesn't hinder the player from exploring other skills either. Um, our leveling system is you know every time you reach a level you get ten experience points or ten skill points, excuse me, and um, and you have tagged or talented skills, skills that you're talented in, and those skills get plus two. Again, this is a nod to the PMP. Mm -hmm. Um, but if you find that the party is lacking in, say, uh, repair, right, repair or science, you can put skills into those, or you can put points into those skills, and you could be uh, very easily a, um, you know, a, a mechanic who also is really into uh, uh, survival or first aid, who's who's been in, has enough injuries to go, hey, you know what, maybe I should put some points into first aid and really take care of, uh, help take care of my party and everything. So even though the, uh, the, the archetype comes with a package boost with an expectation of this is, uh, this is gonna benefit uh, these, uh, these skills as you level, you still have the ability to uh, um, expand the character. Um, you don't. You don't get shoehorned. Mm -hmm. That certainly makes sense. Now, I also do. Now, I could. I could. I could extrapolate that the reason for the AP system once once again ties back to Fallout PNP, but. I'm curious as to why you stuck with the AP system instead of a action economy. Or an action hierarchy, I, should, I, I suppose is the better word. Uh, flexibility for the character. Um, I, I feel a, a action economy or, or hierarchy um, limits what people uh, do. And uh, there is an opportunity to do more than one thing within the 10 seconds that every player gets in their turn. Um, I, I also feel that players are incredibly creative and, give, and affording them those opportunities allow them to come up with ideas that we're not going to come up with. Mm -hmm. Um it also offloads some of the work for the GM um, because of action points. The player thinks about how they're going to do things ahead of time, and if they have the points and they have the skills to do it, then they execute it. Whereas I feel like like a lot of times with uh, the, the the action economy system, it's I want to do this, and then it's up to the GM on the spot to try to figure out how it's supposed to be implemented and rolled on. Um, by offloading that workload from the GM and putting it on the players, and it's it's not that heavy of a lift for the players. Players tend to figure out what they're going to do um, when it's not their turn. Uh, gameplay seems to go faster. Mm -hmm. And truth truth be told, there it, there's always there's always been waffles about about how to. How how to speed how to speed up combat or, or the like, in many right. many discussions. But I honestly think those discussions about speeding up combat are seeing the forest for the trees. Largely because I think a lot of people look at combat and role playing as mutually exclusive affairs. Right, right. In reality, they're not. Plus. How how many t how many times have have we seen plenty of drama in fi in film or television all around a fight? The classic cliche of the samurai duel in a burning temple. Right, right, right. The drama is 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 literally dripping from the walls. Mm -hmm. And 
I look at that and I think, why can't why can't we have that? Why can't combat encounters in role playing games have that same level of drama? Well, you know, I think there's a lot of, for the most part, I think it's a lot of it's it's habit. You know, I I know that's you know people get accustomed to how things are supposed to get done, and few players, um, you know, I. Yeah, yeah, I I'm created morticians and I play it at least once a week in some capacity and I'm constantly working on it and I, and and I love it, but I also play uh D&D once a week. And uh the amount of players who are not prepared for their turn is always astonishing to me. Um and that's one of, that's another reason why I like the action point system because it's like, hey, once your action points are done, you're done. Um and it, it 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 allows the players to think about things in a, in, a, in a different way. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, with with that in with that in mind, when it what would you say, what would you say were some of the were some of the big learning experiences that you had while developing uh, morticians were. Th were there any instances during playtesting where, so, where um, some sort of happy accident ended up happening that you had to address? Oh, yeah. Um, several, actually. Playtesting play was probably one of the most enlightening experiences we had. We had a couple of playtesting events before a big one we did at the, over at the uh, Dragon Horde here in town, which is our local game store. And several things happened. One was uh, there was one player... Uh, incredibly confrontational and he's actually now one of my really close friends excuse me um, and he is a lawyer for the uh, patent office so he likes to take take things apart and uh, you know one of the things with playtesting is you ask for feedback and he's like I'll just email it to you and I got five pages of feedback from him which was absolutely incredible um, in his his detail of tearing, well, why can't I do this and why can't I do that um, was really enlightening. But the big one that uh, came from from gameplay was uh, one of the players wanted to try to lasso a monster. I've got fifty feet of rope. I have the monster. I have a survival skill. How can I lasso the monster? And it was in the midst of combat, so that raised the question that we really hadn't thought about was how do you deal with non-combat skills in the middle of combat? Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, leave it to a player to come up with something you've never thought of before to force you to go, okay, I need to address this, I need to create a whole system of rules that will easily... Um, uh, uh, help uh, funeral directors navigate if something if something comes up. Um, I have a tendency to to write things on rails, you know, tick tick tick, and then this, and then this, and then this, and then tick tick tick, and then this, and this, and this. Um, because uh, as an author I, and a storyteller, I I I think story driven, and then that that doesn't always uh, transition to players. So, uh, you know, the, 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 the resolution for that was, well, we have, it's an action point system and we have skill systems. So basically, here are the instructions to break down every task to remember that it's going to cost AP and it's going to cost a skill. And so that was very enlightening and it, that bore a lot of fruit, a lot of conversations and um, it ended up adding a lot more to the, uh, the introductory set crossroads that we'll be releasing and um i have a whole new project to expand upon in the core rule book as well mm -hmm. so he was a literal rules lawyer yes yes he was um and by the way if you're ever doing a play testing event get one of them there you know most people are very kind and you're like hey here's a, a, a questionnaire to fill out afterwards about how you feel about the game give us all the feedback you want and we're really looking to poke holes 
we were really looking to poke holes in what we were about to sell because it's like, look, there's going to be blind spots that we can't see. We want to make sure that our customers get like the best package. And people are really, really kind. And they're like, oh, well, I really like this. And this was really fantastic. Um, they don't give back a lot of negative feedback. Maybe a note here and there. Um, the uh, four uh, individuals who are our funeral directors Who's, which is what we call our, our GMs. We call them funeral directors. Mm -hmm. um, they did some deep dive stuff from their perspective, and they came back with a lot of notes. But having someone who's like literally like, I'm going to write you four or five pages of questions and ideas and why um, really elevated the game to a better place. Yeah, I could, I could certainly see that. So... With that, with that in mind, this is this is a question where there's no right answer, but just just wanting to pick your brain as far as preference. Okay. Do you find morticians to work better in, um, for lack of a better term, grid combat or theater of the mind? Hmm. That's a very good question. Grid combat or theater of the mind? I um, I lean towards grid because of uh, action points and because there are things that, you know, range plays uh, a part in it in, in some degree. There are abilities that uh, um, increase range for melee weapons and give you bonuses, and there's tactical stuff for, like, flanking and, um, and cover... So, in in that regard, I like the the grid play, but it's not shoehorned in it. You could easily do it theater of the mind. Mm -hmm. And li like I said, there's no wrong answer for this. It is right. it is the equivalent of some of of arguing whether it's whether Mossberg or or um, Remington or make better shotguns. It's. <laughs> It's, um. <laughs> it's it's down it's down to personal preference. It's about right. I've I've seen some people go as dumb with this to the point where it sounds like um, rednecks arguing about Ford or Chevy. Chevy. Um. <laughs> <laughs> um. Yeah. No. It's I've. Well, we just did an episode of Ladies of the Horde where, you know, two-thirds of the episode was uh, battle maps and grid, and the last third of it was all theater of the mind. And uh, with my improv background and performing arts and everything, I actually really enjoy the occasional theater of the mind. I kind of sit on the fence between both of them, you know? Um, but I I really get a kick out of minis. Mm -hmm. <laughs> The only time I've, the only times that I've really, tr really, um, felt like I had to do theater, theater of the mind is s some games where it's obviously designed for it, or if I have a combat encounter where I'm dealing with verticality. Right. Uh, and since since I'm a big fan of of like Ace Combat, there's been my fair share of times where. I've wanted to. I've had to come up with new mechanics on the fly to try and replicate dogfighting. Right, right. You know, it's it's interesting. You know, you bring up uh, dogfighting because um, in the core rulebook there is driving mechanics, and my first approach to driving mechanics was, well, it needs to be executed in theater of the mind because uh, with P and P, for example, the drive mechanics really bog down gameplay really slows it down mm -hmm. um car has a turn the driver has a turn everyone in the car sitting has a turn um and then you know so uh do you have to deal with turn radius acceleration and stuff like that so my first um like i said I, i've been working on this since 2012 so the first section about driving was oh you do it in the theater of the mind because it's no it's it's no good to put it on a map um then uh, during one of the playtesting events uh, a funeral director was like yeah 
but this, 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 and this. And I went, okay. So I actually had to go back and create and l evaluate how to create uh, driving mechanics that streamlined it. And um, it now could be done both ways. I I feel like you sh it, it you come to the realization it comes down to the players. Um, there are players who love crunchy and they want it to take forever. And there's some character, you know, some players who are just like, no, let's get this done. Um, so the driving mechanics for morticians, it's there. Um, but I always tell people it's funner if you do theater of the mind. And I do, I do remember have I do remember um, Spycraft 2.0 having a uh, having a set of a set of printable cards for its for its own version of chase sequences. Yeah. Given that it was doing spy fiction, there's the question of, okay, are we going are we going full James Bond? Are we going Jason Bourne? Are we going Mission Impossible? And the answer is yes. Right, right, because you can't have a good spy game without a car chase. You de and you definitely can't have a good Mad Max campaign without one. That's almost blasphemous. <laughs> <laughs> and you know that's kind of the fun thing about Morticians is you can do uh, you can do a Mad Max campaign um, very easily. I intentionally uh, I have a friend who works uh, on pumps uh, um, oil pumps and he's worked in the fuel uh, industry as, as a welder and we've, we were having conversations about the time I was working on things and, and in the beginning and you know he pointed out that you know most people don't realize this that gasoline has a shelf life diesel has a shelf life like it it goes bad um, not, not to mention disposable parts and vehicles and modern day vehicles so the idea of you know 50 years of these automobiles running is is really kind of uh, uh, kind of far fetched but um with morticians only being 7 years after the end of the world uh fuel is scarce but parts are still acquirable so like the whole mad max idea definitely can be played uh, with the mortician system and um, you know Sanctuary Valley being a valley in, uh, um, a farmland has a lot of open roads so this idea of the wanderer driving down these random roads uh, is very appealing mm -hmm. speaking of that given the presence of Sanctuary Valley I'm curious if in the full book you have plans on doing macro play defined macro play how do you how do you how are you seeing that i'm more referring to mechanics of mechanics where where um the where the focus is on the set on the settlement and managing it and ex and expanding it basically expanding upon the holding um mechan sort of stuff that was in say a d and d but was kind of undercooked Right, right. Kind of. Um, uh, Matt Cavell has uh, strongholds and followers, where you're 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 managing your stronghold of various types and the followers and and how to expand that camp. Because at a certain point, people get powerful enough where they want to settle down and, and have their own kingdom. Um, that is something that we haven't started on, but is something we are th interested in doing in the future. Um, I'm a big civilization fan um in fact when i decompress i put on civ 5 and i'll spend hours just clicking away um it's kind of a mindless activity but the idea of, of expansion so there is there is um there is a thought behind that um but nothing's in development as of right now i hope while decompressing by playing civilization you you're not trying to um negotiate with montezuma I never negotiate with Montezuma. <laughs> <laughs> or 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 try or try and do peace talks with Gandhi. 
Uh, I, uh, I've actually, what I'm doing now, I've got a system in place for how to win. And, um, I, uh, I'm actually just working through achievements right now. So, um, I just kind of lean it like right now. My game is, uh, um, Merchant of Venice, uh, whatever his, his name, his title is the Doge. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah, I'm just kind of I kind of lean into what each of the um, the historical figures uh, bonuses are and try to beat the game and just check off those boxes. It's the AI is really simple um, compared to other stuff now, and um, it it's interesting trying to come up with new ways to challenge myself. Um, so right now I'm just kind of spinning my tires, just knocking out achievements. Mm-hmm. So, I I just had I just had to make <clears throat> to make that joke because the only thing more <laughs> ridiculous is Elvis as your advisor, which is one yeah. of those things I al that people always do a spit take when they when they're not as familiar with Civilization or at least the um the early entries and how you could have Elvis as an advisor. Um. Uh. But yeah, no, um, we've actually have, we're already working on various uh, expansions to the core rule book. Um, so in Morticians, it takes place in Sanctuary Valley. There's a coastal mountain range to the west and there's a mountain range to the east. Um, and both of those are controlled by different factions. Uh, to the north is just empty um, kind of dead man's land, but to the south is another mountain range, and on the other side of that mountain range is Los Angeles, or what we're calling Necropolis. So we do have ideas for uh, um, for expansions, just focusing on the uh, mechanics and co economy of each of those factions. Uh, we have an idea for an expansion that just takes place in uh, a major city like Los Angeles or, you know, New York or Chicago. Um, and in those expansions, would the stakes would be a lot higher because even though, you know, 10% of the population is still there, there's no resources to draw from. One of the nice things about Sanctuary Valley, it takes place in the Central Valley, but really could be any valley, you know, in the world. Um, we have farmland and, and ag and we also have oil and water resources and stuff like that to kind of play around with with, uh, with with story. But when you put the the morticians in a location like say Chicago, um, you have this the Great Lakes just down the road, um, and that's about it. There's no oil. There's not a lot of ag land, um, and you are completely outnumbered. So there is a, an idea to like kind of dive into that in kind of like a, I don't want to, I don't want to say hard mode, but you know, a more challenging, how do we get out? How do we, how do we create the community and then get, get the community out of, of dire straits? Mm -hmm. So with that said, what, what would you be shooting for as far as the page count for the full book? Oh, we're uh, books already. I think 190 pages without art. Mm -hmm. And we have uh, what I'm what I'm what I'm proud of the most. Working on with the book is there's two chapters dedicated to first time GMs, and and one chapter is just kind of a guide to how to utilize the beastery and the equipment and how to structure. Uh, it's mostly just like the aids for for GMs, but there's a whole chapter that is focused on first time, never played any before, uh, anything before GMs. And I think it's one of the biggest failings with uh, Wizards of the Coast uh, with the Player's Handbook is that it's it's here's the Player's Handbook, go, and they don't do a very good job teaching a very crucial. Um, a part of role playing, which is the funeral director, it's the leader, right? The person who, who comes up with the story. Uh, I've heard time and time again from first time players or seasoned players is that that first experience was really hard. 
um, get a couple of friends together. They're interested in playing. They get some resources. They try to play, and they just they struggle because there's no guidance on how to do it. And so, with the core rulebook upon its release, there's going to be a whole chapter that just talks about, hey, look, you don't have to be Matt Mercer. Here's where the bar actually is, and it's incredibly low. And here's some tools to help you give yourself and your players a really fun first time experience. Mm -hmm. Now, I know that you're pushing forward with the Crossroads demo. Um, what would you be shooting for as far as the release window for that? So Crossroads, uh, Mortician's Crossroads, the introductory, introductory undertaking. Um, right now, it's uh, because we're releasing it on Kickstarters, it's, um, it's looking like September 1st. Originally, it was May 1st. Um, we've worked with two really great companies who helped other uh, games launch. Um, and it's a, it's a numbers game uh, with social media marketing. And um, we're working with them to get, uh, you know, one of the things about coming up with a whole new system and a whole new world is there's no community. And um, they're helping us introduce it to the world and sh uh, show people uh, that there is a new alternative uh, zombie apocalypse game that they can play. Um, and so right now our target is hopefully September 1st, but it really is uh, community driven. So uh, the more people who are excited about it, who want to want to play it and get involved, uh, the faster it'll come out. Looks like I lost you there again. You there? I should be now. Hello? How about now? There you go. You're back. Did you get all that? Um, I was about, I was about to say, I, I do want to give my thanks, f thanks to you for taking the time out of your schedule and braving the hell of time zones to come all the way to... All the way to my temple. Hey, thank you very much. And we're uh, we're, we're excited for the opportunity to talk about uh, something we're so very passionate about. Mm -hmm. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I and I lost you again. <laughs> As I was saying, um, anytime you wish to return <laughs> to the temple, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. Cheers. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk. Stay fucking frosty, everybody. <laughs>